Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a guest with a fascinating family story, a story that is truly how this country was built, a story about an entrepreneur immigrants. What is an immigrant? Why are they important? And why should an entrepreneur care? An immigrant is a person who comes to live permanently in a foreign country. Immigration is the international movement of people to a destination country of which they are not natives or where they do not possess citizenship in order to settle as a permanent resident or naturalized citizen. About 3.4% of the global population, 258 million of the world's 7.7 billion people, are international migrants. Almost three quarters of immigrants are from less developed countries and and slightly more migrants move between poor countries than from low income country to a wealthy one. Now, there is a lot of talk out there about whether or not America was founded by immigrants. I'm not going to get in that, but I will say this. American has more immigrants right now than any other country. Before 1965, Germany sent more immigrants to America than anywhere else. After 1965, Mexico did. But it was not because of World War II. Each country was given a certain quota of immigrants who were allowed to come into the United States each year based on who's been in the country in 1890. Combined with the existing laws that prevented any Asian Americans from coming to the country, the laws of the 1920s basically froze the demographics of immigration population in place until 1965. As more Americans are leaving Middle America than moving there, with the exception of North Dakota, immigrants are forestalling Middle Americans' demographic decline, per Vox.com. A Chicago Council study in 2014 found four metro areas, including Davenport, Iowa, on the Illinois border, and eastern Minnesota. They grew between 2000 and 2010 solely because of the immigration population, and another five were immigrations made up more than 50% of the metro area's total growth over that time. And that is why an entrepreneur should care. Because of World War II, there was a huge labor shortage, and the United States started to encourage seasonal labor from Mexico. Some 2 million Mexican immigrants came to America under the program from 1942 to 1964. Most of them worked directly with DDT, you know, the insecticide that is also known to give carcinogenic and toxins in humans. Carcinogenic means it has the potential to cause cancer. The program was set up to prevent migrants from becoming immigrants, requiring the Mexican workers to send 10% of their check back to Mexico. Don't even get me started about the 120 Japanese Americans that were forced into into entrapment camps in the Western United States. According to the Bush Center, immigration fuels the economy. When immigrants enter the labor force, they increase the productivity capacity of the economy and raise the GDP. Their income rises, but so do those of natives. It's a phenomenon dubbed the immigration surplus, and while a small share of additional GDP accrues to natives, typically 0.2 to 0.4%, it still amounts to 36 to 72 billion per year. GDP is gross domestic product. It is the total monetary or market value of all of the finished goods and services produced within a country border in a specific time frame. In addition to immigration surplus, immigrants grease the wheels of labor markets by flowing into industries and areas where there is a relative need for workers, where bottlenecks and shortages might otherwise dampen growth. Between 2010 and 2022, the U.S. saw the slowest population growth of any decade since the 1930s. In recent years here in the U.S., fewer children have been born. Immigration levels have also decreased according to FWD.us. Future immigration is needed to increase the U.S. population size overall, but also to maintain a senior to working age ratio for growing the U.S. economy. According to FWD.US projections, the U.S. should double immigration levels to remain globally competitive with other economies to keep fiscal programs like Social Security strong. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. Immigrations are highly entrepreneurial, launching new companies at twice the rate of native-born Americans and creating large number of jobs. All of this increases employment opportunities for native-born American workers, boosts wage, and strengthens the middle class, according to FWD.us. Immigrants added $2 to the U.S. GDP in 2016 and $458 billion to state and local and federal taxes in 2018. Yeah, much to popular belief, immigrants actually pay taxes. In 2018, after immigrants spent billions of dollars at state and local and federal taxes, they were left with $1.2 trillion in spending power. 
which they use to purchase goods and services stimulating local businesses and activities. Proposed cuts to our legal immigration system would have devastating effects on our economy, decreasing the GDP by 2% over 20 years, shrinking the growth by 12.5%, and cutting 4.6 million jobs. Rust Belt states would be hit particularly hard as they rely on immigration to stabilize their population and revive their economies. As I stay often on this show, we are a globe of entrepreneurs. Our color does not define us. Our place of origin does not define us. As Robert Kennedy once said, our attitude towards immigration reflects our faith in the American ideal. We have always believed in possible for men and women who start at the bottom to rise as far as the talent and energy allow. Neither race nor place of birth should affect their chances. The American ideal is the American dream. A dream that I too have. A dream that is bright and colorful. Because in that dream, I see all of you. I see a world of global entrepreneurs. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest comes from a family of entrepreneurs who migrated to the States in the 1980s. She has been featured on Portland Monthly, Fox News, Coin6, and The Oregonian. She is the founder of Shakuri Me. Please welcome Nye Zhao. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the founder of Charcuterie Me. I'm excited because she brought over some samples. I'm going to dig into them as soon as she leaves. Nai Zhao, how are we doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm excited. I'm really excited because I feel like you're making food art. Honestly, you really are. Now, before we get into the Charcuterie Me, let's introduce who is Nai. Sure. So I grew up here in Portland, Oregon. I am the child, um, the youngest of three, to uh, refugee parents. They actually immigrated here in the 1980s. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a backstory because we're kind of a small group. So me and people um, settled here in the 80s following the Vietnam War and the Secret War. So we are a nomadic group of people that kind of settled wherever they could grow crop. And so that happened to be in the mountains of Laos. And actually during the Vietnam War, the USCIA recruited some of our people along with Hmong people to aid them and give intelligence and also serve in the war for US soldiers. Um, And then after that war ended, we kind of had to resettle um, the Laotian army thought of us as traitors and so they were they had to flee so my parents packed up everything they could as adolescents and as kids so they settled in Thai refugee camps for years my dad I know his family were there for five years until they got sponsored over to the U.S. and they settled here in Oregon and so that's kind of our backstory um they came here with nothing that's incredible so this was back in the 80s or- yeah my dad came here in the 1980s and his his siblings came over first and okay. he had to wait a couple years because of the resources that um, sponsoring families had to get them over here so they had to wait in refugee camps wow and that's I, you know it's kind of funny uh i'm an 80s baby so i'm like that's not too far away i always feel like nine, 1990 was like two years ago but yeah so it's been like 40 some years of them being here so i feel like our people are pretty new here you know in terms of settling in america yeah now, are your parents, you know, they came to America. Did they become entrepreneurs? Did they start their own businesses? Yeah. So my dad, actually, my entire life, he's been an entrepreneur. Growing up, he was a real estate agent. Um, and then that evolved into owning apartment complexes with some friends. He ended up buying a livestock farm, which was really fun to grow up in, going to farms, to the farm with him. 
Um, and then eventually they bought a gas station. So he's a serial entrepreneur. Wow. Um, so I feel like it just runs in my blood and like now I'm taking it, owning it and running with it. Love it. Now, charcuterie me. What is it? So charcuterie me is a curated spread of artisan meats, cheeses, and antipasto delivered right to your door. We have individual boxes as well as a subscription option for people who just can't get enough. Oh, wow. They want to indulge. I'm totally like that. Like I want to treat myself when I feel like I deserve it. Yeah. And so it's kind of like treat yourself vibe whenever you feel like it. So you can get a subscription. Um, you can order individual boxes. I also do catering and events. Oh, wow. And yeah. I, I must admit, I for the folks that are listening, when I actually scheduled you, I posted, I, I was, we are, you know, doing this. I had so many people reach out to me and be like, yeah, I actually had security me at this event and I had it at this wedding. So you've, you've been all over the place. That's so cool. Yeah. I was at a networking event a couple of weeks ago and a friend was like, walked somebody over cause she wanted to meet charcuterie me. Oh, and it's like so <laughs> wild to me. Like who You're am famous. I? Who am I? All I do is run a small business. No, it's amazing. It's, it's a good business when people are actually wanting to come back to you. Yeah. Word of mouth has been my biggest, um, promoter of my business. So why charcuterie? So a friend of mine introduced me to charcuterie almost 10 years ago now and I fell in love with it immediately. Like I'm a complete omnivore. I love the meats and the cheeses. <laughs> yes. And I just like I was interning for this wardrobe stylist at the time and I remember he had read a book and he said that subscriptions are like the way to go. It's a great business yes, model. Yes, true. I would because agree. Because you get that guaranteed income from a customer for like 12 months, right? If they opt in. So that was in my head. And then I ended up working at the city of Portland, Prosper Portland. And I saw that I was in the entrepreneurship department and I saw how many resources there were in Portland in the food community, especially. And even my boss at the time had um, shout out Felton and Mary's. They do barbecue sauces. So my manager had a side business and I was like, I can do that too. Like I want a piece of this pie. Yeah. Like, I saw how much support there was in the community I was like, let me just try it. I think charcuterie is awesome. I was waiting for my charcuterie platter at a local restaurant one day. And I was like, this could be a subscription. Like I can only get it at a restaurant. Yeah. People need this in their homes. Yeah. So that was when the seed was planted. <laughs> and then fast forward to March, 2020, when the city shut down, people started make, baking bread. Remember? Yeah. Oh my God. My wife tried to do the sourdough. Yeah. I never did the bread, but I saw people doing it and selling it out of their homes and I don't think this person does it anymore, but <laughs> they were selling bread. And then eventually I saw them post, they were selling charcuterie out of a pizza box. Oh, And my friend sent it to me and it pissed me off. Because, <laughs> like I already had the idea and I just didn't jump on it. Oh man. So that was like the, the little thing I needed to get it going. So I just put together a package, posted it on the Instagram and just sold one box at a time, built my website. I'm, I'm a really nerdy person, so I like building websites, um, doing like HTML, but just like oh, all wow. DIY. So like that's pretty easy to me. So I created my website, took orders, and just started fulfilling them on like as I was working my full-time job when we were all remote. So I could only deliver between 4 to 6 p.m. People just had to take that because <laughs> I had to work during the day. <laughs> Nobody could complain because I have to work. Or else you're getting no security. Yeah. So that's how it started. Wow. And so did word of mouth. So you just started marketing through Instagram or did you go through like any fairs like farmers markets? Not in the beginning. So I just was doing Instagram and my friends like that's how you can tell you have real friends is the ones who support your business. That's, hey, that's very true. Yeah. It's very true. And people just started buying and sharing about it. Um, the biggest break I got in the beginning was November 2020. I got featured on a local morning show. And so I think that was what like kind of made my business boom. Um, I got a little small business feature on KPTV and yeah, so I didn't do any markets because I'm still kind of a team of one. So I did my first market just last summer and it's so much work. I recruited my sister. <laughs> we were dying, like our feet love hurt. It. We just don't have the, I don't have the man capacity yeah. right now to do markets, but I love it because people get to try it and people learn about me. So yeah, eventually I'd love to do more markets. You know, I think you brought up a great point by saying, you know, how you're pissed off that somebody else had did it. It's like, that's, that's basically entrepreneurism, right? It's like the difference is doing it. Everybody has the idea. Everybody has an idea, but exactly. the difference between an entrepreneur and somebody else is the entrepreneur actually takes that idea, put a business plan behind it and moves forward. 
Yeah, and it's somebody told me it's not about being the first to market, but it's about your execution. And it's true. like, I think one of the most valuable things I have is my vision. Anybody could sell charcuterie, but they don't have the same vision for the brand yeah. as I do. Yeah, like there's m- so many. many now. Yeah, there's. I'm sure there are, but you're the one. You're the one here. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about like the 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 operations behind it. So what kind of food handling things? What kind of things do you have to go through to actually be able to do a charcuterie board? Yeah. So the very first thing I did when I knew I wanted to start this company was I registered it. I registered it with the Secretary of State, which is the state of Oregon, got my Portland business license. Those are pretty cheap. It's like $50 a year or something. And then the next thing is definitely a food handler's card. I think those are active for three, three or four years. Um, And I've worked in food business before. So like the questions are super easy for me. Once I started working in a commissary kitchen, you have to get insurance. So it's like a restaurant insurance. That was about... $300 $300 a year or something. So yeah, insurance. Oh, you definitely have to get certified by Multnomah County Health Department. Oh, okay. So they come to your kitchen and they just inspect that everything is stored the way it needs to be, that you have the right um, sanitizing solutions and they kind of talk you through or you talk them through what your process is when you're preparing foods and they just give you tips or show you how to correct the way you're doing it before they certify you. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. And they're so supportive. Like, I remember they wanted to come to my kitchen and I kept like avoiding her (laughs) because I was so scared. Like, and they're like, no, don't be afraid. Like everybody's so scared, but they just want to support you. They want to show you the right way to do it because it's food safety. So yeah, don't be scared. They're so nice there and so available. You know, this is, I feel like this is the second time in this interview, you kind of mentioned the support you got from the food industry in Oregon. Kind of talk about that. Why, what kind of support did you receive? Yeah, I'd love to shout it out. So when I had the idea, this was back in 2019, a coworker was like, hey, you should go through this business boot camp. And I was like, maybe I should. So I went through Thai XL. Mm-hmm. Um, Thai is a huge organization, like worldwide, but they have Thai Oregon locally. And so they have a business boot camp. So after work, when we were still working in person, I would two days a week, three hours a night, um, do this business boot camp. And it's like a concentrated version of creating your business plan it was called a lean canvas so they would bring in experts to talk you through different components of it I had to to validate my idea I had to do um, market research I had to practice pitching and so that was about like an eight week or something thing Um, I came out of it having validated my idea and it was like I recommend it to everybody if they have an idea yeah talk to people about it practice it like go for it and one of the outcomes that they say about Thai is like even if you go through it and you find out your business is not viable that's a good outcome because then you don't waste your time fail fast right yeah Yeah. fail fast pivot so I did that so when I worked at Prosper Portland one of the programs we have is inclusive business resource network so Prosper funds about 16 different community organizations to provide business technical assistance And so I worked in that department. I met a lot of people within the food industry. They support other businesses as well. So yeah, you can get free workshops. You can get classes. You can meet with a business advisor. And they definitely want to support business owners of color. Like that's the main priority. They have grants and a monthly newsletter of resources. So everybody should take a look at it. Nice. Now, so, you know, what, what you, this is a lot of work, right? Being a small business owner, going through the process, going through a business kind of incubator and then doing it while doing a full-time job. What motivates you to keep going? What motivates me is I want to take this as far as I possibly can. I just want to like pave the way. I want to be a representation of what you can achieve with a dream because my parents never like told us to like chase your dream. They wanted us to pursue something safe, right? It was about survival for them. And so I did go into school for something safe. They wanted me to do doc, like be a doctor, but I was not studious. So I went, (laughs) I started as a science major. I'm not academic. I tried. But you build code. (laughs) You build, you build in code. You're not, how does that, I'm just a nerd, like I'm a nerd at heart, but. So I went into social work, but I never got that creative outlet because Mm. I was like working in a safe job. And so. That's kind of what motivates me is I always knew I could build a brand. I just never got a chance to do it based on my experience. Um, So, yeah, I want to be an example of, for especially for young people, that if you set your mind to something, just try, like, just go for it. Yeah. See how far you can get. Yeah. Now, you you talked about the brand and you talked about, like, website design. What, what, what goes into building a brand? 
what goes into building a brand is um or what went in actually specifically what went into building charcuterie me charcuterie brand. is i have a point of view like i knew that i love charcuterie it's my passion and i know other people love charcuterie as well so it was easy for me because i was like selling to myself i was imagining the customers myself imagining them having the same taste as i do wanting to treat themselves and like the voice i use in my social media and my posts it's like very fun lively and trying to be vibrant making it accessible to people who don't know a lot about charcuterie want the convenience of charcuterie you know we don't have that much time in our days yeah that's so, true yeah <laughs> i don't know what else. Yeah. no now what about the what about the actual meats and the cheeses where do you get those products from I get them from wholesale distributors. I work with Peterson Cheese. Um, I do buy some local cheeses sometimes, but most of them are imported. The local ones are kind of expensive for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're local. Yeah, there's I local. Be yeah. Most, yeah. So I buy them here. I buy them from them. I, right now I'm using Cheddar Curds from Face Rock Creamery, which is local. So it's just like kind of depends on what I'm looking for right. at the time. And I will buy new ones to test them out, see if I like them. Like the the box I brought you. I'm trying out this new chorizo that I found. Oh, nice. And some new cheeses like Jasper Hill. It's a har- harbison. It's a soft ripened brie. That's really good too. So nice. I'm gonna, yeah. So I kind of like, it's trial and error. Like try something, see if I think that maybe it'll appeal to a lot of people's taste yeah. and then incorporate it yeah. slowly. Yeah. Now, do you go out and like test all of these items before you put them in your box? Yeah, so oh, nice. I get to I get to order online. Like I'm a total online shopper, so when I order my <laughs> produce, it's online. Even though I pick it up locally, I'll just look through their catalog and see if it like piques my interest. Um, and then I'll order one one portion of it and try it out and see if I like it. I get feedback from friends and family if they like it, and so I have a pretty good right now like a starter charcuterie platter of cheeses that I know a lot of people like. Nice. You know, I was thinking right now about um, Portland Salt Company. Uh, I just listened to that podcast. If you want, I think the the pita salt that they have, if you have hummus in your charcuterie, mm-hmm. it goes pretty well with the hummus. I it's pretty solid. I need to check solid. them out. Yeah, I follow them on IG and yeah. I heard the episode. And, yeah. They're great. They're awesome people. Now, back to charcuterie me. What keeps you up at night as a business owner? So many things because I wear every single hat. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's like a list of things that are urgent, a list of things that I want to do. So it's just, yeah, like mentally, there's so many things. Like I know I'm out of nuts right now. I haven't ordered them. (laughs) I have emails that I need to return. It's a lot of inventory because even in one box, there might be like 20 different items. And so it's all in my head. Like, do I need to order produce yet? No. Do I need to order cheese yet? Salami yet? There's an endless list of things. How do you stay on track of all your your to-do lists? Do what you can. Wait till tomorrow to do the things you can't do today. Procrastination is great because it gives you just amount of enough time to get things done. Yes, because in the morning it's like I have to make the boxes, then I have to deliver them. Wow. So you and still kind of do this all by yourself? By myself. Sometimes I call on like an on-call delivery driver. I've tried to hire a couple times, haven't been successful. Like I missed the the big hiring thing before the Great Recession. Yeah. And because I was still working full time, I couldn't hire. And I wasn't big, you know, I hadn't grown enough to feel comfortable putting somebody on staff. So, so you've ha- grown big enough that you can bring on staff? I want to bring on somebody part time. I need a food stylist so that at least the manual labor can free me like if I don't do if I don't have to do that I can focus on creative stuff like I love marketing I love testing ads I want to do a photo shoot I've only ever done one photo shoot for the company two over almost two years ago wow so those are the fun parts for me like partnerships and collaborations I haven't been able to focus on because I'm doing all of the actual work now you you keep mentioning like marketing and branding do you have a background in marketing and branding? No, I just feel like I've grown up with social media. And yeah. so I would follow brands that I love, especially fashion brands. And so I've always observed and felt like that job would be so fun. And so I just want to test things out. I want to have cute campaigns, you know, it's just fun for me. Yeah. Then what do you use to kind of do your marketing? Social media. Um, I'm not so great at ads. Um, I have one Google ad going. It's like, not it's like ten dollars a day it doesn't get me much but i just want to show up yeah. so i'm just <laughs> testing it out um haven't done facebook ads as much those haven't been as fruitful so yeah marketing is just my social media if 
people aren't paying attention to their Google business profile, it's a hidden gem. Like some of my photos that I've uploaded there have like 20,000 views on oh, one single photo. Like it's great. It's like, wow. I don't know how, but add photos because people are seeing them somehow. I, that's very good to know. Yeah. That's pretty snazzy. Now let's, I wouldn't, I kind of want to have, let's go through the process of like, what are, what are the people telling you about the safety requirements and all these things? You mentioned they're kind of going to your kitchen and what are they telling you? Like, what are the things that you just kind of have to abide by? Things that you have to abide by um, is where to store the fresh fruits and meats and cheeses. For me, because the meat is cured, it's not like a raw meat, so it can be stored next to cheese. It can be stored next to fruits and veggies. But if you had like raw meat and eggs and poultry, those have to be like on different shelves and stuff. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Dry goods are okay on the same shelf. Like my boxes, my peanuts and um, other dry things are okay. But when it's inside the cooler, yeah, there's different standards you have to have. Like I think meat cannot be above eggs on the shelf because of the dripping oh. potentially, which I don't have to worry about, but yeah. Now, is there, do you rent like a kitchen, like a professional kitchen? Yeah, I rent a commissary kitchen, so I share it with other makers. Okay. Mm-hmm, and it's hourly. Oh, okay. So do you just kind of keep your items there and then you go there? Yeah, storage is an issue for me. So right now I'm working on getting my own kitchen space because I want to be there whenever I want to be there. Right. Um, so sometimes I forget things at my home because I have to store like boxes there. So it's a hassle. I have to drive back sometimes in the morning, you know. <laughs> I'm a creative. I'm like, I all love over it. The I place. love it. <laughs> I'm owning it. I lo- <laughs> what would you say is the hardest part about being a business owner? The hardest part of being a business owner is managing your time, I think. Because there's so many things that goes into it. You have to manage inventory. You have to manage emails. You have to take calls while producing something that you hope people want to buy and keep buying and coming back to buy. Yeah. yeah. What, what about, let's flip it. What, what has been easy? What is easy? I think the making, like now I've gotten into such a routine that my process when I'm making the boxes is pretty easy for me. I know how much time I'll need a day. Also, social media is just fun. It's not easy because Instagram is hard. It keeps changing and Instagram's everything. Super, yeah, yeah, but it's still fun. So I think that's easy because like I just put it out there and see how it performs. To me, like that's fun. Yeah, I, I same way. I don't, in fact, I think I was talking about like um, brand strategy the other day, brand guidelines. And I'm like, I have a very, very loose brand guideline. Same. I'm just like, it's my own voice kind of. So I think that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you ever had a moment of like self-doubt about the business? Yes. Last summer, I got like the, one of the biggest orders I had at the time and it was for the Blazers. Oh, wow. It was wild. And I said yes, knowing I couldn't really do it by myself. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly (laughs) God, man, that's how entrepreneurs live right there. (laughs) You say yes. Yeah. And then, so it was like during playoff time, which was super exciting. So I don't remember. I think this was June. And like, they didn't know when they would need it because it depended on when the Blazers lost. So they wanted to do like a celebratory day for all the staff. So it was a huge order and I ended up delivering it late. We stayed, we like pulled an all nighter. It was me and like two, three other people kind of taking shifts when they could come or not. It was like my cousin and a couple and acquaintances so we ended up delivering it late I was really hard on myself and yeah I just kind of like needed a couple days to process it because I wanted to do better Um, I just didn't have the capacity it was a learning experience but it was like the biggest opportunity the freaking blazers yeah I'm from Portland yeah Um, so I haven't heard from the person that ordered since but it's okay It's okay. It was super exciting and I learned from it. Um, yeah, so I just like had to like go dark a couple days and then I reached out to, um, back to community, right? I reached out to another food entrepreneur, Nikisa Newton. She does Meals for Heels. It's a vegan oh, interesting. food delivery service. She actually has a spa off at the Red on Salmon, like a little um, standalone food uh, walk-up window. I reached out to her and it was funny because I told her what happened and she was like, oh my gosh, I just went through the same thing this week. Like it was something that oh. made me want to quit. And so it felt so good to like talk about it with somebody and feel like heard or, you know, that she understood what I was going through. You know, you mentioned this opportunity with the Blazers. You mentioned opportunity on the news. How do these opportunities arise? I really believe that if you build it, they will come. Like I've been so blessed and so lucky that I've built a brand that people can see. 
Like I'm vi- I'm pretty visible. I think I have good SEO on you know Google if you search our good Dude, help me out. <laughs> Come help me out, man. Mine's horrible. Yeah. Um. So people can find me and like these opportunities just come like I have a lot of earned media. I got a Portland Monthly feature like I was printed. It was my first print in a magazine and it's a Portland Monthly. It's still on newsstands right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was really cool. Yeah. So I just think if you build it and you focus on it and you have a strong brand, the opportunities will come. I like it. I like it. Now. What what advice would you have for like the listeners at home that are maybe thinking about getting into this business? Into this business, like into this. And like into the food business. Into food. Or just, just advice. Advice. I think you need to just go for it. So when I first had the idea, I wanted to be the HelloFresh of charcuterie. But I lagged for over a year because imagine the packaging. Like yeah. I had no idea what to do. I didn't have any money until when the pandemic hit, I pivoted. I was like, let me just do something in person, local delivery. So yeah, just try it. If it goes well, like I wasn't scared of failing. I knew that if I failed, I still had a job and I could do something else. You know, I wasn't putting all my eggs into this charcuterie basket. So just try it out. Learn as you go. Like I was literally buying stuff at Costco in the beginning because that's all I knew. Yeah. Until I could like get the capacity to research where to buy cheese from, where to buy the great, the good meat that I like to use. Another one is if you are starting a business, try not to do it by yourself (laughs) because I started it by myself. So now I don't know if I could bring somebody on and give them equity Mm. because I built it, you know? So if you can come up with an idea with somebody so then you can have a teammate. Yeah. You know, you kind of actually mentioned this a bit like networking. How important has networking been for you? It's been amazing. Like it's word of mouth is my biggest marketing um, and the relationships that I've built with people along the way, like I just did a graze table for Peterson Cheese. Actually, this week was the American Cheese Society conference in Portland that I had no idea about until, <laughs> which I should know, right? I should be a <laughs> member, but I can't afford it. But my cheese person recommended me to his company, Peterson Cheese, and they hired me to do a graze table. So yeah, like that opportunity came because I've been ordering cheese from them for like a year and, you know, we have a good relationship. Yeah. That's something I've learned as I've gotten older. Like in college, I did not invest anything into relationships, you know? And I think as you get older, you have more confidence. And because I started doing like fashion styling before I did food, I had to network in Portland. And so I kind of got comfortable meeting people. And yeah, so relationships are everything. Definitely find your community because there's a big food community. I I heard Portland Salt Company talk about the FIC, which is the Food Innovation Center. And I think yeah. Nukes Hot Sauce also went through that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I, there's, it's interesting how powerful networking can be for, now you mentioned something um, very interesting. You mentioned that, you know, when you're in college, you, you didn't really have much relation or didn't really pay too much attention to relationships, but you said also because of confidence. Mm-hmm. Where did you find confidence? How did you build it? I think I'm working on it every day, <laughs> but I think I'm confident because I believe in what I'm doing right now. Yeah. If you tell me no, it's not like a no, it's not like a final no period. It's like there's a way. You just have to you just have to believe in yourself, believe that there's a problem to the solution. Yeah. I, I like it. Yeah, a no is just like a opportunity to pivot. Yeah. Like I pitched to Bridges is a meeting that Built Oregon does and it's um, meetings with buyers of like New Seasons. I think Basics Market was there. I pitched a little charcuterie container box thing that I would want to see in retail and um, the main issue is when you slice cured meat it's like a deli meat so it can only last three days oh interesting meaning basically you can't get into a store because how can they sell something on a shelf in three days by the time they get it but when I heard that they were like maybe you should just not include meat and I was like no (laughs) (laughs) charcuterie means cured meat so yeah like I heard that and that's fine I'm just tabling that opportunity for now because there's other things I can focus on. So does that, is that true? Does charcuterie meat uh, mean cured meat? Yeah. So um, charcuterie comes from the word like flesh in French and I can't remember now. I just did a TikTok on it. <laughs> Interesting. Charcuterie means cured meat. So that's why when you go to a restaurant, they have charcuterie boards. Sometimes they have cheese boards because they're separate. Oh. Yeah. Charcuterie is mainly the meat. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. 
I think it, it means cooked meat. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. interesting. But like cured meat. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Learn something new every day. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> so where do you see security me going in the next five years? Where, where are you at? In five years, I definitely want to be able to ship my boxes. That's something, you know, I still have the HelloFresh dream. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Um, But it's like the logistics and packaging that I don't have the time to research right now. I definitely want to have a bigger team, of course. A headquarters. I just, yeah, there's like, the limit doesn't exist. It's like what I can dream and what I can execute. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be interesting, too, if you're able to do it on the national level and maybe mm-hmm. have individuals at those locations helping you create the boxes. Yeah, like franchise is something that's been thrown around. Oh, man. But there's, yeah, there's already people, you know, there's charcuterie everywhere now. Like that yep. was like one of the biggest industry booms during the pandemic. It's really? Because now my feed, because I do charcuterie, like my feed is all charcuterie from everywhere. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Once you start searching charcuterie, oh. you'll start to see. <laughs> Just, yeah. There's like a hidden little network. Yeah. It's, it's big. Wow. People that are bigger than me and like on a scale bigger than me, but that's not stopping me because, you know, I'm starting here. I'm going to yeah. grow where I can. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Speaking of social media, where can the folks at home find you? Where are your social media? What's your website? How can they actually purchase? And, and where where do you deliver to? Yeah. So website is www.charcuterie.me. Um, I deliver like between 20 and 25 miles outside of Portland. So when you go to check out, you pick your box that you want and I have a thing that pops up. You choose your delivery date. So if you were to order today, it's Sunday. The earliest you can order for is Wednesday. So about two days in advance. And then, yeah, I do the local deliveries. If you have an event, you can put in a submission form for your event and then I can coordinate whether I have a availability that day or not. Oh, and then Instagram is charcuterie.me. Facebook is charcuterie me. Follow us on TikTok and Instagram. <laughs> That's where I put my focus. Perfect. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm currently, I, yeah, I need to narrow my focus because I have like the LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm not really active on Twitter. I think like LinkedIn, I get probably the most traction just because of the yeah. podcast yeah. is kind of professional. Your audience. Yeah. You know, I did it finally. I did an analysis like where should I put my marketing efforts? Instagram is not like a cut because I have a question. How did you hear about us? They don't choose Instagram most of the time, but it's more fun for me. So I know. <laughs> still. Dude, same, same with me. I have like nobody follows me on Instagram, but that's where I spend most of my time. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, we need to adjust some things, but <laughs> And then Twitter, it took two years for people to start mentioning me on Twitter. Like I've had the account, but just this week people have been like tagging charcuterie me. So it's like yeah, random. Nobody tags me on Twitter. They will. Please tag me. Yeah. <laughs> you can at me. <laughs> Nye, thank you so much for being on the show. Such a great conversation. I'm excited to dig into the charcuterie board myself. Folks at home, please, please can support a Niner in the Security Me business. I'm really excited. Again, please let me know. Let, In fact, before we go, is there anything you want to say to the guests like that maybe might be able to help you? Hey, you're looking for help. You're looking part-time positions. Yes. Shout out. I have um, the job listed on my website. I'm looking for a food stylist part-time. Yeah. What is a food stylist? A food stylist? I made that up, I think, but... <laughs> I just need somebody to make the boxes with okay. me. <laughs> so you. food styling, you have it's all about making it pretty. It's about making it, yeah, look nice and gotcha. appealing. So designing the box. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's an actual job, but I like. I yeah. I thought it was for like, damn, this sounds <laughs> legit. <laughs> this is, where where did you learn to do this? Yeah. <laughs> Pinterest. <Nye. laughs> Pinterest. Oh my goodness. Nye, thank you so much again. Folks, please visit security.me and you can please follow the shades of E on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and all those other locations. Although again, I don't do it much. But it's <laughs> okay. If you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.